I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, I was never given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows fences below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary stretches are underway. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Old School. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good buddy, Chief John Salka. And we've got another good one for you today. Um, we're going to take, uh, take us up a different level when it comes to the whole... Uh, uh, supervising uh, the supervisor kind of thing. You know, we talk a lot about leadership. Uh, we talk a lot about management. We talk about the supervisor and bring all three of those things together like we should for, for the good and great bosses out there. And uh, uh, John, um, especially, you know, I, I guess, you know, we need, we need to, we need to talk about this on, on both levels, you know, both, both on the volunteer side and the career side, you know, we've, we've said before a firefighter is a firefighter. Uh, you know, in most cases, it's just simply one gets paid and one doesn't, but there are some different duties. There are some different, uh, uh, you know, little things that go along with those two different positions. One being the fact that on the career side, they pretty much have to do what you tell them, you know, when you're supervised, you give orders on the volunteer side, you know, kind of along the same thing, but you got to be careful because you don't want to, uh, you, you don't want to, um, uh, run them out of the firehouse. You know I mean? It's, you know, there, yeah. <laughs> I guess, John, that's one thing. Before we get into our topic today, supervising the supervisor, touch on that a little bit. You're, you're, you're currently the chief of your volunteer department. You've been, you've been doing a volunteer thing for over 40 years. And, 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 you know, we're talking coast to coast, and I know it varies depending on where you're at, where there's a little more tradition uh, with some of the older states, if you will, in the way of the departments and volunteers. But um, there is a difference, isn't there? I mean, when you talk about supervising a supervisor, as, as a volunteer chief, you know, you can't, I mean, it's one thing in the, in your career side to say, Hey, you know, do this. And I'm telling you, know, right. When you gotta, when you gotta stand someone up, that's not really doing their job. It's a little bit different. Yes. You got to hold people accountable and you can't just give away the store at the volley place, but you know, you can't run them off the door either. Right. I mean, isn't there a little bit of finesse that you have? I guess that's the word finesse as the leader. You know what? And, and, and you and I have both been career and volunteer firefighters and officers and you know it. And so does everybody that's listening, who's been both. They are dramatically different. You know, there's some stuff that's the same. There's some principles that are the same, integrity and working hard and, and, and you know, everybody pitching in and stuff like that. But there's some stuff that's dramatically different. And, and there's some stuff that you can do in a career firehouse. There's, there's ways you can talk to people. There's things you could unload on them as a career firefighter that, that they're going to take, may not be happy about it, may, may, they may be bashing you around in the kitchen a little bit, but they're going to take it because it's their job and it's their livelihood and it put, puts food on the table. And a volunteer might say, what? You know? So yeah, you gotta, you gotta treat them a little bit differently. Not on every issue, not in every circumstance, not every, every single firefighter, but you, you got to keep that in mind. It's dramatically different. And, and we just had a couple of little issues in my volunteer fire department lately. And, and, and I had to deal with people above, you know, commissioners and people below and at the same time, and sometimes it's a little bit of a bouncing act. And when I remember being in the 18th Battalion, I just said what I wanted, when I wanted it, and it happened. You know, it was a little bit different. So, yeah, if you're a two-hatter, if you, if you do both of them, if you're a volley and a career guy, and you've had some experience in both, you know that. Um, the bottom line is wherever you are, number one, wherever you are, you got to figure that one out. If you're just a career guy and you never were a volley, don't worry about it. If you're a volley and never were a career guy, again, don't worry about it. That's your whole fire service world. If you're both, here's the important one. And, and I learned this lesson a long time ago. I'm not blowing any smoke here, but, and some guys don't learn it. You, you, have, you have to make sure you know you're in two different places. You come back from the big city fire department, you're a chief in the 18th Battalion, blah, 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 FDNY, everybody does what you tell. All of a sudden you show back up at South Bloomin Grove, don't expect everybody to jump to and do exactly, to treat you exactly the same way uh, in a volunteer firehouse as they might treat you in, in a career firehouse. I'm not saying they treat you better, worse, 
with respect, without respect, I'm saying it's going to be different. And I never had a problem doing that. I put a different hat on. I come to South Bloom and Grove, I got a different hat on. I'm just one of the boys, you know, whether I'm the chief or not, nothing to do with it. But then you go to the city and, you, and you're the chief and you're the chief to everybody all the time, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's quite, I hate to say it, but it's quite complex. You really got to pay attention to what you're doing and who you're talking to and, and, and how you, and how you're talking to them. Well, exactly. And, and, um, you know, we, our, our good friend, Tom Merrill, uh, from, from, you know, uh, in, in your home state there. Um, he, I, love, I love Tom. <laughs> Tom, Tom does a great job, um, promoting uh, the fire service, but especially the volunteer side. Uh, he's got a great, uh, uh, you know, webpage, Facebook page, uh, Twitter, the whole thing called the professional volunteer fire department. And, um, uh, he's talked about this many times about, you know, it, it's like you're walking that tightrope where you don't want to drive people out the door, but at the same time, you know, there's a level of professionalism we have to adhere to. There's, um, uh, there's things that have to be done. You can't, you know, we've seen this before, you know, sadly the public doesn't, most of the public doesn't know of a career department from a volunteer department and they, they just see it as the fire department and whatever we do as firefighters, whether you're wearing that T-shirt out there in the public, the hat, driving down the street, you got the sticker on the back of your pickup truck or your car, people identify you as one of us, and you're acting on behalf of one of us, and what you do reflects on all of us. And it um, doesn't matter whether you volunteer your career, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to conduct, a firefighter is a firefighter. Um, but 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 there is there is there is a a little like you said, John, a little bit of finesse. You know it because you can't drive people out the door, you know. Um, you know, people are committing their, their personal time, um, you know, for Absolutely. drinks and, drinks and meetings and making calls at two in the morning, sometimes showing up late for the job that pays the bills at home. So, you know, there's a lot of sacrifices that are made there uh, on the volunteer side. But at the same time, there's a level of professionalism that, that you need to adhere to to make sure that, that, everything's, that everything's done right. Yeah, go ahead, buddy. Another thing you got to remember is they're there for different reasons. There are some similarities. Everybody who's a firefighter, volunteer, career, part-time, paid, you know, whatever. Everybody loves it. You just have to join the fire department and you start to love it. If you don't love it, I mean, it's just you'll end up on the wrong planet. I just can't imagine. <laughs> but putting that aside for a minute, everybody is there for different reasons. Some, some guys take the fire department test and it's the first time they ever said the words fire department. And they get in the job and they love it just like everybody else did. But they got into it because it's a great job and it's civil service and it's got a nice pension and wow, I can raise a family on that. That's just what I was looking for, dad. Great. Thank you. You know, the dad suggested they go down there. Other guys join the volleys when they're 18 years old. Again, maybe dad's involved or the family's involved or maybe your buddy's involved, which is how I joined. Uh, and they just join the volunteer fire department and then they're hooked. They're like, this is fantastic. And you can be there for 30 years and you don't get a nickel. You don't get one nickel the whole time you're there. Money isn't involved at all. Money doesn't, doesn't, you know, enhance it or subtract from it in any way, shape, or form. But you got to remember, there's people there for different reasons. Some volleys are in it because they love it, they live it, their dad was in it, they're third generation, and you know, and you got to remember that. And and there's other guys in the, in a paint department. Some guys are in a paint department, like you said, get the wrong book, the checkbook. You know, like some guys are there to collect the paycheck, and some of them are even good firefighters and good officers. But when they walk out the door, the door closes. They don't think about the fire department not for another minute until three days later when they come back to the and next John, let me, let me ask you that, you know, because, you know, we're, we're going to get into a little bit more here about supervising a supervisor, you know, as well. But you bring up a great point about, you know, some people being able to go home and shut off the job. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you know, you and I are into the job, you know, we, we whether, whether we're in the firehouse, away from the firehouse, on the phone, whatever, you know, I had a hard time earlier in my career, um, looking at people that weren't into the job like me and going, how could you not be into this job? You know, there were just guys that just showed up and did their thing. But, but here's my thing. You know, if you're going to show up uh, for your shift, let's say your career shift, as long as you get, as long as you give me or give us your best effort, that's all right. Isn't that what we're looking for? Give us your best. When you go home, if you turn the job off because you've got side jobs, family, whatever, if you don't, if you don't think the fire department, what, what, for one second on your days off, you know, I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I don't think you're going to be as dialed in as some of the guys that are into it all the time. But at the same time, I don't think it's a bad thing because as long as when you show up, when you hit the door, you know, that be here now thing, right? Be here. Be here. I, you know what? I'm sitting here waiting for you to stop talking so I can say that. Be <laughs> here now. That's your guy, right? Be here now. As long as they give 
as long as they're into it when they're there, whether it's on a call for the volleys or during a shift for the paid guys. And I know guys that are great guys that give 120%. But when they go home, they got a ranch, they got a farm, they got a mechanic shop, they got a gas station, and they are not thinking about the fire department. They're thinking about their side job. Or I got guys that do homeschooling at home with their kids. So when they're off duty, they're home with their wife, teaching the kids and stuff. And I think that's all wonderful. It does not detract from them at all. No. Well, that's right. That's that's uh, Battalion Chief Jerry Wells from Louisville uh, that that does some great programs out there for our listeners. He's another guy you need to have come out um, and 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 you want you want to get you guys dialed in, fired up, and aligned with our with our way of life in the fire service. Have Jerry Wells from Louisville, Texas, come out. Uh, great guy, family family. Dad was the Dallas. Uh, Dallas Fire Department tells you for a long time, a uh, long time on the job, another great boss. Uh, Jerry gets it. And, and he's that one with, you know, that be here now. It's like, you know, when you show up at the firehouse, whether it's for drill night or it's for your shift, just be here now, you know, and, and, and give us the effort that, that, you know, that if you're going to brag, if you're going to wear the t-shirt, if you're going to have the stickers on your car, then, then live up to the reputation that so many people before us have worked so hard to do you know, when it comes to, so ex- exactly. So it's kind of that whole, you know, you know and like that the, affects what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about, you know, supervising the supervisor. We're talking about the different levels of the different chains of command in some departments, the different levels of supervisors and how, although we know a Lieutenant or a captain, a first line supervisor in an engine or a truck company in a typical firehouse supervises their firefighters. We know that. Right. Right. On duty and on runs and at jobs we're talking about today the next step, we're talking about the captain, like in New York City, they get a captain of a firehouse, just one, of a, of a company rather, not just of a firehouse, but, and then three lieutenants on the other shifts. So, so this captain not only, not only supervises firefighters on a shift, just like his lieutenants do, like his counterparts do, but he also supervises the lieutenants, although he doesn't actually work with them. There are different shifts. He's the guy that lays down the law or sends down the sheet on how the uh, equipment's going to be carried on the rig or how we're going to this, use this new tool in the company, right? They, everybody has input. Any, any good captain or company commander is listening to his firefighters and listening to his junior officers. But, but that supervising the supervisor relationship is a little different than supervising absolute subordinates, which is firefighters. Well, and what, you, yeah, what you're hoping is, even though, you know, that lieutenant may be one of the newest officers on the department, let's say, okay, you know, we're talking first rank a lot of places. Um, we're, we're hoping that there's a little bit more fire service maturity, I guess it is there that, You've got someone who's promoted in that position. They've been doing this for a little bit. You know, they've, 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 they've been a firefighter. They most likely most places have been a driver, you know, driver, engineer, chauffeur, you know, driver, operator, whatever you, whatever title you use in your department. Um, so we're hoping there's a little bit more of a maturity level there, obviously when it comes to it. But, but again, you know, the, 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 when you're talking about supervising the supervisor, you know, there, there's a little, as what you have to do with your, with your firefighters, sometimes you really have to put your arm around them to make sure they're not doing something to get themselves hurt or good intentions can lead down bad, bad roads, if you will. Um, it's making sure that your, your lieutenants, and, and let me just point out, John, you, you know this as well as I do, you know, a lot of departments you'll have, and, and maybe we'll touch on this real quick. Um, I don't want to grab your thought from you there for a second, but, um, you know, in FDNY, you've got, you've got your captain you know, that owns the house, if you will. And then you've got the lieutenants that, that pretty much work for that captain, like in a lot of places, like Chicago, same thing. Um, Louisville, they did away with the lieutenant's position before I got there in 2000. So you had all captains and the companies. And, you know, at our, our big house for a while, we had an engine and a tower ladder and uh, with two captains, but there was a senior captain that was in charge. So I guess basically where I'm going with this, someone needs to be the landlord, right? Someone needs to own the firehouse. Otherwise, it's kind of like Camp Runamuck, right? I mean, it, it's it's the bag of marbles hits the floor and go in different directions. Someone needs to be in charge of the firehouse, right? Whether it's the, the firehouse budget or where the how you do things, whether you paint walls, don't paint walls. You know, so someone's got to be the landlord, right? Right, absolutely. And and but before I lose my thought, I, I want to touch on something you already yeah, mentioned, and that was you know like the difference between lieutenants and captains in departments that have that, or or you can even say the difference between newer, younger company officers and more senior company officers. So in the FDNY, we have obviously lieutenants and captains. I'm a battalion chief. I see a new, I see a new lieutenant walking across the floor or sitting in the kitchen in the morning. I know I got a guy that was a fireman. He was a firefighter 
last month or six months ago, right? Which means he's still a firefighter in his head. He may be a young guy, he may, may be preparing for years like I did for each rank and for each test, but he's still just got years of experience as a firefighter. He's getting his legs, he's learning, but, he, but he's brand new in the field as a lieutenant. <clears throat> I must tell you that I treat, I treat that fella, that officer, I don't want to say a lot differently, but but much differently than I treat a brand new captain on his first day sitting at the table. A brand new captain is not a brand new officer. He, but if he's a captain, it means he was a fireman, he studied for lieutenant, made lieutenant, bounced around, got a spot, probably stayed somewhere for a couple of years, took a captain's test, waited on a list, and now got promoted. He's got years and, under his belt as an officer. Exactly, already. and they, they've already been riding the front seat, right? They've already been given given the codes, talking, pulling up, making decisions, <clears throat> you know, running their firehouse, doing the journal, the firehouse journal, you know, taking care of people and people problems and so on. So if sometimes if there's no captain on duty, you're it. You're the boss for that day. Exactly. So, but, but kind and of. And the real difference is then this leads into the, the other point you just asked me to mention. So this leads me to, so what the heck is the difference then? Why do you have lieutenants and captains? You know, is, is a captain just a, a senior lieutenant with more experience? And the answer is, well, maybe, or maybe not. Obviously a captain is, the same thing as a lieutenant when it comes to sitting in the front seat and, and stretch a line and let's put this fire out and nice job, Billy, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But the captain and, and, and the FDMY, captain is the civil service rank, but you can be covering around as a captain. But when you get a spot somewhere, when they assign you to a company, you are a company commander. And now you're actually the boss of that company and you have a lot more responsibility as far as evaluations go and, and as far as uh, answering to the, to the chief. When I was a chief in the 18th Battalion, Anytime something serious was coming down, any change in policy, any issues that had to be sort of uh, ironed out, I went right to the captains. And if it was either directly on the phone or via, or via a report or a letter or a note to them, and I sent something out to the company commanders of Engine 48, Engine 88, Engine 45, I listed six companies and sent it out. Obviously, the lieutenants would read that. They would absorb it. They would pass it on to the firefighters if it was a policy about overtime or whatever it was. But I addressed it to the captains because that was my next level of command. My, my chain of command down was to the captains. And it was always great to know I just had a talk to Louis Kickers in 88 Engine. He was the captain. Louis, did you get that? Yeah, Chief, I got it. All right, I'll call you back later. Take a look at it and let me know how you can handle that. All right, thanks. Done. Done. I talked to one guy, one conversation. I know the whole company. Now, I have to talk to the captain of the truck, too. In the FDMY, every company is individual. Every company has a captain and three lieutenants and 25 firemen, so they stand alone. And here's the one more unique thing I want to mention before I, because I'll forget it, is in a double house in the FDMY, both companies stand alone. They both got their own hierarchy, their captain and two lieutenants, and, and three lieutenants rather, but the engine captain owns the place. The engine captain, by virtue of history, by virtue of the, the, the landlord, owns the building. The right? landlord. Oh, so if a window is broken, it has to be repaired. If a, if a requisition has to be put in to fix the roof, all, it all falls on the engine because the engine is the landlord. Even me as a battalion chief and in with 45 engine and 58 truck, I was a tenant. I was a very happy tenant, but I was a tenant in, 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 in the firehouse and the companies take care of the firehouse. So it was pretty interesting the way it's been set up, but it was always great because everybody had one boss. Everybody had one person to go to, you know, even the lieutenants in a company. Well, and I, I want to ask you real quick, while we're, while we're talking about supervising a supervisor, um, two different people came to mind when you talked about, because, you know, <clears throat> the great the great guys that, and gals that I've got to work with and privilege, I mean, um, and I'll get I'll get to them in a second. Uh, uh, you know, we mentioned about, we mentioned Battalion Chief Jerry Wells. Uh, like I said, dad was on, his dad was on Dallas for a long time. Jerry's a great boss, a great BC uh, in Louisville there. Um, you know, Gary, Gary Apple, there's another great boss. Gary is just... I loved him. He was great when he visited, yeah. Oh, Gary is Gary is golden, man. Gary Apple is the kind of kind of company officer <clears throat> that you want to work for. But it's, it, and I, I guess I want to touch on two people. We're talking about supervisor and supervisor that, and one of them I would have loved to work for. Okay, and and one of them was I think the the captain on uh, uh, fifty eight truck Tower Fifty Eight, Joe P. Joe Precipio. Right? Is that how you say his last name? What I mean? Precipio. They call him the Prince. Oh, I just, you know, I, I, I got to personally witness him at, at, at several runs with you. And I, just, I loved his mannerisms. I loved his, the way he, he took care of his crews, um, you know, both in the firehouse and out, because we know anybody can get out there and bark orders at a call. 
it, but it all starts back in the firehouse. But talk about Joe P, Joe P for a second, because he just seemed like one of those guys that the guys really enjoyed working for. And, you know, y- y- yes, they really enjoy working for him. No doubt that he's the boss. And I've known Joe for a long, long time. Number one, Joe's been a captain, company commander. Joe was the captain of 58 truck when I was the captain of 48 engine. Wow. Since then, I got promoted, made battalion chief, covered for one year, went back to the 1A, got the spot there, stayed there for 17 years, and I'm out for eight years. I'm retired, and Joe is still the captain of 58 truck. <laughs> so Joe's been a captain for a long, long time. I remember Joe as a younger man when he was when he was uh, uh, Lieutenant 75 Engine, which was my uh, my Antichrist. Uh, when I was in 48, we used to bang heads with 75 all the time. And Joe was a little bit different of a boss. He was a younger boss, and like I was, I was a younger boss as well. But I'll tell you what, Joe, Joe was an old-fashioned boss. Joe could work. Joe could work in a uh, in a welding shop or in a gas station or in a factory. Joe's a great boss, and you know, and he knows how to be nice and he knows how to talk nice and he knows how to have fun and he knows where to draw the line and he knows where to say, nope, party's over, get your shit on, let's go. You know, and it's great to see. It was always great to see. I loved working with him because the young guys loved him and and feared him a little bit. And the older guys loved him too. And they knew if you mess with him, you mess with him, just like playing in the kitchen, right? You mother tell you, you play with the stove, you're going to get burned. You know what? If you mess with the captain, things can happen to you. Well, and, and when you said that, and I know exactly what you're talking about. When I talk about Bill Allen, you've heard me talk about my lieutenant, Bill Allen, in Bedford Park. You know, you, you said something that made me think of something. When you said they feared him a little bit. I wasn't afraid of Bill. I love Bill. I, 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 you know, it's one of those bosses that I worked for that I didn't realize just how great of a boss he was till it was, I was out of there. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I don't want to say I was afraid. I, I, I guess I was more afraid of disappointing him. Right. That, that's kind of, cause you know, he had no problem giving me a what for when I need, it, you know, it was kind of like, you know, with your kids, the, the last thing, God, the last thing I wanted was to be scolded, you know, kind of bark dad a little bit cause I'm screwing up or doing something I stupid. I shouldn't be doing by Bill Allen, man, because, you know, then it was like, I wasn't mad. I wasn't holding the grudge. Like, God, I worked so hard to be one of his go-to guys, and I screwed up again. Well, but I guess the best thing with Joe, you kind of said this where I was going with this, as much as they can lean on you, because it's all good, as much as they can jump your stuff when they need to, you know, it's all for the right reasons, right, John? It's all because that, that's like a good parent has no problem keeping your kid in line because they know what's out there. Right. And, and we're talking to fire service this is dangerous shit. We go to a lot of funerals. We hang bunting on firehouses all the time. And, and a lot of that bunting, I'll just say a lot of that bunting would never have been hung. Not all the time, but a lot of times if the, if the officers had done their jobs and stopped being a buddy as much as, you know, they need to be a good boss and be the leader and separate those two from buddy to boss. And I think Joe's one of those guys that, that can do that. Joe's a great example. Joe's a great example. And although I must admit, I was, I was, you know, blessed working in the 18th battalion. I didn't have, I didn't have a weak company also, not in the 17 years I was there. I had one or two guys that were, that were, I had a couple of really, really strong, like, beyond excellent officers I, the rest of them were all excellent officers and i had one or two guys that were you know that that maybe didn't measure up to the rest of them but they were still but they were still good my my point was i had all really great officers i didn't have a i didn't have a bad apple in, in the bunch and and what happens is is and again it depends on the structure of your department my, my department is very battalion organized you know everybody's in the battalion that's what you do your overtime that's where all the firemen work most of the officers well the officers travel farther for overtime and stuff but Everybody really concentrates and gets to know all the officers and chiefs in the battalion that they that they're assigned to, and that 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 communal that communal group of lieutenants and captains really do affect. Just like all the rest of us, you get a new job, you go somewhere, you start watching what everybody else is doing. If you go somewhere as a mechanic, you watch the other mechanics. You see what time they start, how long they take for lunch, etc. How long they take to do an oil change. You try and fit right in, and you know what. And it's great when you have great offices there already that set a great example for the new. So, so talk while you're, while you're doing that, because we're going to get to a couple other points here too, but because we're talking about supervising a supervisor and you, we talked about Joe, you know, and I know there's a captain that oversees, you already mentioned him on 88 engine. All right. That oversees that whole company, that whole firehouse there. So let's talk, let's knock, let's go down one more notch and talk about Timmy Klett, Lieutenant 88 engine. 
Um, why, it, just, it just explained, because there's a lot of aspiring officers, John, that listen to this show, watch this show, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and when we meet with them, that are looking for those hints as to what they need to do to be that great company officer, to be that great boss that, that the supervisor supervising a supervisor, okay, <laughs> you know, the, the kind of boss that you know you could put in that firehouse, and I, I, I don't say you don't worry about him, but you don't worry about him. You know, talk, talk about Timmy Cliff for a second, though, because Absolutely. I know how much respect you have for him. And it was always fun whenever I worked and he was working. We worked together a lot. We were in similar groups or similar shifts like everybody else would think. Um, and I would always stop over there. And, you know, that's something the FDMY does. The time chief stop, at least they're supposed to stop, in each of their commands, in each of their firehouses. You know, every time they work, you're supposed to make a stop there. So you work... You worked nine times this month. You, you should have made nine visits, right, to different firehouses. Um, and I always stopped over there. Um, I only had three firehouses, so I lived in one of them. And I only had two to visit. Sometimes I go to the division, which is in one of my other firehouses conveniently. Then I had one firehouse in between, which is where Tim worked, uh, 88 and 38. Great place. And uh, anytime I stopped in to see him, it was always a pleasure. It was always a pleasure. There was usually a cup of coffee on the table, or I'd walk into the kitchen and they'd say, hey, Chief, you want a cup of coffee? Yeah. So I'd, I'd get a cup of coffee. We'd sit down. You know, Tim, Tim would come down if he was upstairs or if he was already sitting in there, we'd, we'd say well, hello. Let me interrupt for a second, John. Let me ask you, it, because I've been there with you and I know how it was with me. When you said there'd be a cup of coffee on the table, that could be a good thing or I don't want to say a bad thing. That Either the cup of coffee is like, hey, Chief, how about a cup of coffee with us? And you sit down oh. and shoot the bull or, uh, we, Chief, we need to talk. We need to talk about something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that happens too. And that's part of being a boss. Sometimes you get, you know, some days are diamonds, some days are stones, you know? So some, some, some days it goes great and you walk, you skip out of somewhere and you say, wow, what a great place. What a good boss. And, and you drive away. And sometimes you walk out saying, oh my God, how am I going to handle this? You know? But, but the point is, whenever Tim was working, it was great. Cause number one, I knew he knew his job. He was a great fireman from a great place, 69 engine, hopping place, plenty of fires. That's where, that's where he, he didn't actually break in there, but he ended up there and spent a lot of time there. So he makes lieutenant. He, now he's an 88 engine, a true engine officer. You know, and I say that all the time. Some guys are engine officers because because the busy trucks are all full. You right. can't get into a truck. Well, a lot of departments like Louisville and, and even New York City, right? I mean, over 200 engines and 140 trucks. There's, there's less trucks even in New York City. When you get a smaller scale department that has 21 engines, sometimes they have five trucks. It's hard to get a spot in the truck. So I would often end up with guys that were firefighters in an engine as engine officers. And sometimes I get guys that were firefighters in a truck as an engine officer. And they were good officers and they knew what they were doing, but they didn't have 10 years riding an engine. You know, Tim did. Tim was a great engine officer. I never questioned anything he did. I never really had to worry about that. He know what to do. And <clears throat> that was just the work end of it. The other end was stopping by the firehouse. They're in the middle of a drill. They're upstairs crawling under the beds with the SCBAs doing reduced profile. And it, it was always just a thrill to work with him to see what he was doing. I have a great story and, and he's going to kill me for telling it. <laughs> One day, we, uh, one day we were visiting 88, we, me and the aide were visiting 88, and, and a run comes in for, I forget what it was, smoke or something in a school. It was at night, 9 o'clock at night. And we go on the run, and I just happen to be in quarters with him, and, I, and we're on the same run. Normally, I'd be coming from farther away. He would have been there way ahead of me. But we get there. I park the car. I go walking in. He, he parks, you know, they come in behind me with the engine. He comes walking down the block. And as I go in and I make the turn, I see some smoke. And I, as I turn back around to come out, I'm like, I turn around and look at Tim. Tim's coming down the sidewalk. And what is he? He's got his bucket pants on, his, his, his helmet, and his coat over his arm. I never saw Tim responding to a box or walking into a building with his coat over his arm, ever in my life. I turn around and said, Tim, he says, yeah, Chief. I said, there's smoke in there. And he said, the minute I said that, he said, I was mortified. I had the coat over the arm and everything else. I was a little, you know, I may not be getting the details of the story right, but he had his coat over his arm for sure. And he tells that story all the time, how he was mortified how he was mortified that, that I turned to him, saw him with his coat over his arm and said, hey, there's some smoke in here. There was no yelling. There was no instruction. I never said anything afterwards. He, 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 he knew what had happened. Knew, to yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a great example of a good boss. A good boss even knows when, when they get caught, when they get caught short or caught doing it's something. The, it, you know, you said, I always used to talk about, it's like the golden retriever puppy that doesn't want to disappoint, you know, it's, it's owner. You know what I'm saying? It's like, guy, I, I never, like with Bill Allen, I, the last thing I wanted to do, was disappoint that guy. I mean, I just, you know, I remember I could tell a couple of stories. We don't have time that I was like, today, today, it still bothers me because I did stupid, immature, stupid stuff. And I'm like, God, I wish I could go back. You know, I guess, I guess it's all lessons in life, right? But there's things I did. I went, 
oh my God, Rick, I can't believe you did that. You know, and, and, but yet he still put up with me like a good parent would, you know what I'm saying? Because you were, you were a work in progress, you know what I'm saying? All these good officers get these young firefighters or maybe not so young firefighters that come in or enter or transfer or get appointed to a place. And so, so John, let me ask you, how important is it then to, to, as a, as a boss, as the supervisor, supervising the supervisor, how important is it for a chief Salka to hold his captains and lieutenants, if you will, or for a captain to hold the lieutenants accountable? I mean, that, that kind of sets the temple in the firehouse, right? It's everything. It's everything. If, if the lieutenants know, well, I've worked in places where the captain was weak as a firefighter and as a lieutenant, and there was good lieutenants there that kept their shifts going, and, and the other two lieutenants did the same thing, and the guys that were on a captain ship knew he was a little bit weak, but, but they managed anyway. The guy wasn't a terrible boss, but he was just a little weak. And then I worked in places that had really, really, really strong domineering captains, you know, and Listen, I'm old-fashioned. Everybody's called me old-fashioned because I am old-fashioned. You know, not wanting to disappoint the captain or a lieutenant or your boss or your officer is a wonderful thing. But I said it before, and it still is true. There is an element of fear. There were some bosses, like Ronnie Hansen was my captain in a living truck. I was scared shitless of Ronnie Hansen. <laughs> I would never go in the office to talk to him. I wouldn't walk up to him maybe at a company party and say, how you doing, Cap? Good. Nice to see you. Absolutely not. He was a, he was a pretty formidable guy. He ran a really tight ship. I loved working there. It was one of the best places I ever worked. The guys were great. The company was great. The work was there. He was tough. He was tough as nails. And I'll tell you what, I can't badmouth him. I was scared of him. And I can't badmouth him. He still had a positive effect on me. I'm not promoting being the toughest guy in town or being tough as nails. But, but sometimes there's times and issues and people that, that you do have to take take that that well, and isn't it, isn't it part of John setting the tempo in the firehouse where your firefighters, you know, they shouldn't fear you. They should respect. There's a difference between the fear and respect. Some people call certain levels of respect fear. And I, and I, I kind of, you know, always kind of draw the line there going, there, there's a difference between a boss that you're scared of and, and a boss that you don't want to disappoint. I guess that's where I need to go. I, I never, I wasn't afraid of Bill Allen. I was, I was afraid of disappointing him more than anything else. I didn't, I got my greatest fear was him looking at me and giving me that look like, what are you kidding me? Lasky, that kind of thing, you know, which I got that look several times, by the way, was I was returning to fire service, which is part of it. Like you would as a parent, but I guess that's my thing, John is the difference between a boss, the fear, the person that just guys are scared to death of just because they're an ass. And the boss, you're afraid, God, you're so afraid to disappoint because you want, you work so hard to earn their respect and to be the one they give the irons to or whatever. And the last thing you want to do is have, is have Captain Salka look at you like, what the hell are you doing, Lasky? And you, and you and I know, because we got on a job. I got on, you know, the end of the 70s, early 80s. You know, there, there was a lot of veterans around back then, you know, old-fashioned veterans, old-time veterans, old bosses that were, you know, that were tough. And, I, and I'm not promoting that type. But they were there, and a lot of them, were, a lot of them were very effective. Even though, like I said, even, I'm not, I don't, I never, I never didn't respect anybody. But, but sometimes they just had a harder and a gruffer way of doing things. And leadership and company officer responsibilities have evolved over the years, and and it, and that's that's much much more rare now to have anybody yelling or screaming or being so stern that guys don't want to walk past the office. But all I want to say is, even those guys back then had some great some great other skills and abilities that they, they mixed along in with and and they listen you and i are a product of some of those guys you know right and I, I think we turned out okay i'm not blowing smoke here but we turned out okay and i'd like to think that each of us have generated or produced maybe or contributed to some newer bosses you know that, right. that, that come after us and i guess there's a difference between a bully and a thug and a good boss you know there's there's good even bosses that guy, even a guy that's really tough right yeah, I've, I've seen those bosses jack mccassa chief mccassa i never worked for him i worked for him as an instructor mac i mean you know oh god the last thing you want to do is disappoint that guy you know what i'm saying and he ran a taut ship but man oh man he was one of those guys that the loyalty around him was phenomenal because people didn't want to disappoint him so that being said john i guess you know, without the, with the, the absence of that good house captain, that good, that good supervisor, you know, right? We're talking about supervisors, supervising the supervisor, you know, you end up with nozzles being moved from shift to shift, 
uh, crappy movie. You know, I mean, there's someone needs to be the landlord, right? The supervisor supervising a supervisor. Someone needs to be the boss to own the firehouse to say everything from we need to order toilet paper and soap to uh, before we move that on the engine, we're going to have a talk first. You know, we're at a committee because otherwise, John, isn't it kind of like a bag of marbles hits the ground, poof, in its different directions when you right. don't have someone in charge of the firehouse? Right. And what the, what the, what the listeners will, will, We'll all agree to when I say this. They're all going to smile, whether they're running, whether they're in a gym right now, whether they're laying down on a bed listening to this or whatever. They're all going to laugh when I say this. If you don't have that, if you don't have a strong boss of the bosses, you can have three different fire departments in a career fire department. You can have A shift, B shift, C shift. They're right. going to be three different fire departments. The A shift turns out really fast, and, and they do this, and they do this, and they do this, and they don't eat lunch. They go out to a restaurant. The B shift, man, they crawl out to the rig. They hardly ever get out. They're really good guys, but they just never in a rush, and and they don't quite wear the same uniform all the time. And the C shift is the guys that don't do shit. They don't clean the firehouse. The A shift that's cleaned up all the time after the C shift goes on. Why is that? Because there's no overriding boss in the firehouse. There's no boss of the bosses there. There's no, there's no supervisor of the supervisors there. And that's what's great about having either another rank, like a captain that supervises a couple of other shifts of lieutenants, or like a lot of fire departments have two or three captains on duty or four captains in each of the shifts, you know, one in each shift. Well, you make one of them. You make one of them the company commander. Lewis, yeah, Lewis. Well, I didn't. We didn't give him a title, but I had. Well, there were. I mean, and things may have changed since I've been gone, but there was a captain in charge of each firehouse. In fact, you know, right. it, it was right. like because otherwise, John. Again, it's like who knows who's ordering soap. To, who knows who's moving stuff? I mean, someone needs to be the landlord. Someone needs to be the person. That doesn't mean it's absolutely my way. You know that kind right. of thing. Somebody right. needs to be in charge, right? Somebody's got to have the thing on a desk that says the buck stops here. There's got to right. be an ultimate authority in the building that eventually, okay, listen, guys. All right, the A shift, B shift, C shift. We get three different ideas on where this new tool is going to go. You know what? Let's talk to the captain. You know what? Let's talk to the company commander, and, and let's get that done. And I'll tell you another big negative thing, a big negative outcome of not having a boss or a company commander or a unit commander, a gigantic one. Is you know what happens if you don't have one of them? Who does that? Who takes that job over? The senior firefighter. No, no. I mean, some places, yes. Oh, yeah. Some places, the, the battalion chiefs. Oh, yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. Battalion yeah. chiefs are driving around making policy for companies, and I'm like, wait a minute. The battalion chief had to come to your firehouse to make a policy about changing nozzles. There's not, there's not a captain or a boss in a firehouse that says, "Hey, guys, a, a shift, B shift, C shift. We're having a meeting, having a house meeting. No more changing nozzles. Here's the nozzle on this one. Here's the nozzle on that one, and we're not changing them around." But if you don't do that, if you don't have that guy or that gal, if you don't have that company commander or unit commander, suddenly people go to the battalion chief with it. And they're like, hey, chief, you know what? The A shift has this nozzle, and we have that nozzle. Well, and all of a sudden, the battalion chief is doing somebody else's job. Right. And the downside of that, the flip side of that, too, are battalion chiefs that haven't let go of being a captain yet. They're riding around the buggy now, and, and they're like, they're, they're, me they're, they're meddling in the captain stuff. You know, and, and I, it, it's like, it's like, all company officers who still want to do firefighter stuff, you know, it's, I guess it's that we talk about that fire service maturity thing that, you know, when you become a Lieutenant, you know, or first grade company officer, you need to be a boss and let your firefighters do their stuff, lead them, mentor them, show them the way. Same thing as a battalion chief, it's the hardest thing in the world, right? For a lot of good, good, aggressive captains when they make BC is to cut, cut those strings a little bit, you know, and, and do that. Where I was, where I was going with it was, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, in the absence of that, the flip side where I was going was the senior firefighter. Sometimes we talked about this. I've seen it in some of my firehouses where the captain was like, where, where, where's he at? Oh, he's in a shower, in a shower. It's, it's eight Oh five or seven Oh five shifts. You know, well, yeah. What time you get there? Well, two minutes for seven, two minutes for seven. He, he, I mean, he should have already been, he should have already been doing his job. Right. And you got to see right. firefighters taking care of stuff because the company officer is missing in action, if you will. And we've had that we've had that discussion before, both that one about the officer that comes in, has breakfast, a cup of coffee, and, and jaws with the guys down in the kitchen, and then disappears, and you don't see him till lunch or there's a run. The firefighters end up running the, running the company, right? But then, then the other end of it is where you have, uh, and you and I have experienced this, I and you, we both told stories about walking into a firehouse, and you hear a little raised voice discussion going on behind the engine or something, and you hear, you know, the captain. You know the captain's working. Obviously, you're working, he's working. You're coming to see him. And you hear him maybe straightening an issue out behind the engine, and you turn, you tell a house watchman, uh, you know what, tell the captain I stop by, I'll talk to him later. You, and you know what, you don't even interfere. I know chiefs that would double time it to the back there to jump in and see what's going on. 
Not me. I turn around. That's the captain earning his money. That's why the captain gets captain well, pay. And, and earlier – you know early in my career i did that early in my career as a chief i, I meddled where i shouldn't have meddled and then it got to a point where i got the best results like you said by by coaching and counseling the company officers the battalion you know what i'm saying let them do their jobs and don't meddle and, and they'll come to you right they're going to come you say hey chief you got a second hey can you stop by for a cup of coffee you know right like we said when you walk in there's a cup of coffee on the kitchen table one of two things the guys want to just shoot the bull or there's an issue, you know, and, and sometimes it just, you know, and, and that's that knowing that the, their, their chief, all right, that, the, you know, the supervisor, supervising a supervisor, if you will, all right, knows that that boss welcomes input, welcomes questions, welcomes, you know, look, I, I can't run your shift for you, but I want you to come to me before you go out there and do something we have to retrace or retrack or, you know, re, 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 you know re, retread, if you will, and fix, you know, ask a question and then go out and do your job. Here's one more great story that fits right into this. And this is a story you probably haven't heard yet before, but it applies right here. That's why I'm going to tell it. Uh, and it's a Joe Principio story. Joe comes up to me one day and says, hey, Chief, uh, can, can we talk? I said, yeah, come on. What's, what's going on? I said, uh, this new guy that we got, it was a new chief in the battalion. I said, yeah. He said, listen, he's a great guy. We like him and everything else. He said, but, but man, he's all over me at boxes. I mean, like, I turn around, he's there. I turn around, he's there. I'm inside on the second floor. I turn around, he's there. We're, we're like, we're investigating a gas leak. And all of a sudden, he's up on the second floor. He said, you know what? I've, I've been a captain for like 12 years now or whatever it was. It was a long time. He said, and it's not just me. I'm just letting you know. Maybe you could talk to him. Listen, we like him. He's a very bright guy. And it's great having him here. But let, let us do it. He said, for example, yesterday we had a, we had a run for an odor of gas in a, in a, in a tenement. And uh, he said, we were checking out the, the apartment they're called, 2B. And one of my firefighters walked into the laundry room. The chief was in the laundry room up on top of one of the dryers with his flashlight looking behind it. And he was calling me, you know, one, eight, five, eight. I, I think the leak is down here in the uh, laundry room. He said, that's not, that doesn't happen around here. He said, my firefighter was going down there to do that. He would have found that same leak that the chief did. He said, anyway, see if you could talk to him. And I did talk to the guy. The guy was a great guy. He got the spot there. He stayed there for years. He, he was great. But there's a little situation of bosses and bosses dealing with each other. You know, you can't, you can't overdo it. You can't breed down people's neck, you know? Well, you can't, what you need to do and is can we kind of close things out here? I guess one of the messages would be you need to separate, you know, your position from position as you're, if you're going to promote, otherwise we should all wear black helmets and should all be firefighters. There's a point where you're the company supervisor, you know, the Lieutenant or that captain riding that engine, that truck, and then you become the battalion chief and you're running the battalion or that, you know, that, the, that maybe your whole ship for the day and so on and so forth. And I think we've all been guilty a little bit. I guess that's called that, John, that fire service maturity thing you kind of mentioned before, where you learn to keep your nose out of other people's business unless, unless you need to jump in there. And th those needs to jump in should be few and far between, right? That's why that chief was doing it, because he was a fairly new chief, and he was still a captain. In his mind, all of his experience up at the time was captain experience, jumping in there, looking for stuff, finding the leak, and looking for the smoke. And, you know, and eventually he learned. Eventually he started took a step back and a step back, and he, and he was a great chief once he, once he got his legs, you know. But that was a great situation, a great example of, of you know, over-supervising. Over uh, you know, maybe a chief-level officer – over supervising company officers and getting right up there, right up there, you know, right too close to them, you know? Well, we, hey, hey, for our listeners, we've been talking about supervising the supervisor. You know, we've talked plenty of times about being that good boss and taking care of your firefighters, but, but quite often, you know, we don't probably cover as much on, on the end of just, you know what, how about supervising the supervisor and building that, that rapport, building that confidence, uh, building that work ethic, that, that, that builds the future, I guess, of, of your fire department and, you know, allows people to do their jobs and grow into those positions. Uh, we mentioned Tom Merrill, you know, with, with his column and his teachings at the Professional Volunteer Fire Department for you, for you volleys out there. I know a firefighter is a firefighter. We talk about Battalion Chief Jerry Wells from Louisville, Texas, with his Be Here Now and a bunch of other programs. Um, we, and there's a ton of great, great people out there doing great things. But uh, great topic, John, supervising a supervisor. Absolutely. Yep. Well, hey, if they want to get a hold of you, Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. We appreciate you joining us for another one. Um, you know, spread the word uh, about, uh, you know, what we're doing here uh, with uh, old school. <laughs> with old school. And uh, we, got a, we got a ton of, of more material to cover with you. Uh, we always uh, ask you to 
please keep, uh, uh, you know, those out there uh, doing their jobs and your thoughts and prayers. Uh, remember that never forgetting means never forgetting. And we'll catch you at the next one. Be safe. God bless you.